Therefore, the Lord wants to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show mercy to you. That is what we're rejoicing in today, our God that shows mercy to us, and he will be gracious to us. So we are rejoicing in that today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Greg Hogan here at uh, Twinsburg United Church of Christ, and good to see each one of you today. We always like to start out with our purpose of our church. Uh, one of the statements is, we want to be an authentic and welcoming church community, journeying to build accepting relationships with each other in dialogue and love. We believe it is in relationship that we discover more of who we are really. And we are a church that is for everyone, no matter what your background, no matter where you've come from, no matter where you are on your journey of faith or your journey of doubt. We hope that you feel welcome here, and that is our goal. Uh, any announcements that we have today? Just a reminder that today is our community meal. We're serving from four, four o'clock. I never knew. We're here all afternoon, but from four o'clock to, to 530, and all are welcome. If anybody wants to do anything outside to enjoy the sunshine today, Summit Metro Parks is hosting a Maple Mania event at Liberty Park here in town. If you haven't been up there, it's a beautiful place and it's 12 to 4 and I'm going to be scooting out quickly to get there so I can do my unpaid job. But it, <laughs> it, was, it was very nice yesterday despite the lack of weather cooperation. I expect a big crowd today and it's a lot of fun. announcements. Well, let us open our worship time, take our pilgrim hymnals and turn to number seven, or the words will be on the screen, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. If you'd like your hymn book, it is number seven in the pink hymnal. And let us stand together, please. Good morning. Please join with me in the call to worship from the 98th Psalm. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy. At the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And let us pray, please. Oh. 
Eternal God, whose empire promises abundance for all and mutual caring, turn us away from indifference to the inequities that grant to us advantages that we enjoy, that we may see and serve those who are hungry, thirsty, ill-clothed, sick, persecuted, or shut out. We seek to be faithful to your rule of love, that together we might experience your gift of eternal life. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Missing a couple pages this morning. <laughs> the gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. <clears throat> the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or in a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now it's time for us to return our praise and thanksgiving to God through our tithes and our offerings by God giving us the riches that we enjoy simply mostly by being here in the United States of America. We're able to then in turn give to others and have opportunities to be generous for the work of God. So through these offerings we seek to share the good news of Christ, to bind up the injured, to strengthen the weak, to secure justice for the oppressed, and to bring back those who have strayed. So let us join together in joyful thanksgiving as we give our gifts to God.
get it from the doxology. congregation become more and more of a source of hope for each of us and for all that we need. Amen. And thank you. Please be seated. something for you. What? Hey. Hand them an envelope and a card each, please. <laughs> Can you tell me what those are? Envelopes. Well, envelopes, yes, but it's the card I'm thinking about. The envelope and card comes as a set. What does it say on the front of the card? Can you read it? No. <laughs> it's a thank you card. What do you say? Yeah, what do you say when someone has been very nice to you and gives you a special yeah. present? Thank you. Right. And so I'm giving out these thank you cards, and maybe you'll think of someone that's done something nice to you, give you a present, and you can write a thank you note to them, because that's the way, nice way to say thank you. But you know, who has been, who has been good to us more than anybody else? God. God, right. And our gospel reading today talks about God. God, it does. <laughs> And it talks about how we can say thank you to God. How do we say thank you to God? Well, we show how we show our thanks to God. Put it in there. You can put it in there, yes. We, I, I always think that when I say thank you to God, I am nice to someone else. And that's what Jesus said in our story today. That sounded magnificent. Jesus comes down to earth and everybody stands before him. And they ask, he asks them, what have you done for the other people? And that, and Jesus says to them, yeah. Jesus says, if you do it to them, you've done it to me. And so that's what I want to think about today. How do we say thank you to God? We say thank you to God by being good or thankful especially those who can't help themselves, especially those who have some kind of special need. That's a great idea. Hey, why did the chicken cross the playground? Why? To get to the other playground. No, to get to the other slide. <laughs> All right. Have a great wait, time. Wait, I got one more. <laughs> Hurry. Ketchup. Ketchup. Ketchup who? I mean, oh, knock, knock. Who's there? Ketchup. Ketchup who? Ketchup who wins the race. That's Ketchup right. Ketchup who eats the race. Ketchup who eats the race. <laughs> hey. 
come to a place where we have the opportunity to share our request with one another, to bring up our request before our Lord, and to see God's gracious provision in the lives of our loved ones. Who has a request to share today? Your daughter, what's the daughter's? Yvonne. Yvonne? Okay. Oh, daughter in law, yes. Yvonne. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I just want to thank God that I'm forgetful and I wasn't robbed. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Um, Terry? Oh, go ahead, Jim. I'd like to ask for prayers for Missy. She had some surgery Tuesday, so she's home resting, and she's going to need a couple weeks of um, recovery time. So we could use, all of us at home could use a little bit of prayers for strength and forgiveness. And while you're moving up, request today for Janice. She's recovering from a fall. Sharon, as she's scheduled for surgery on Thursday. Oh, I got yours. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then also, um, we did go out and see my father-in-law yesterday. He is, our, over the last several days, he's doing very well. Thank you for your prayers for him. And then finally, pray for Karen as she starts her new job tomorrow. She says, how do I get ready for a new job? And I said, well, it's kind of like going to kindergarten. You wear a nice dress and you smile at everybody. <laughs> All right, anyone else for a prayer request? I only said that because she's not here today. <laughs> okay, and let us look to the Lord now in prayer. And let's start by, Oh Lord, you're beautiful, our prayer chorus. Oh Lord, you're beautiful, your face is all I see. And when your eyes are on this child, Hear our prayer, O Lord. Let our cry come to you. Do not hide your face from us in the day of distress. Incline your ear to us. Answer us speedily in the day when we call. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet unborn may praise the Lord. That he looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord looked at the earth, to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set those who were doomed to die free, so that the name of the Lord may be declared in Zion and his praises in Jerusalem. When the peoples gather together and the kingdoms come to serve the Lord. Oh, great God, today we lift up these requests before you. We pray for Missy, recovering from surgery, for Janice, recovering from her fall. Sharon, oh Lord, we pray that everything will go well in her surgery that she's been anticipating for so long. We pray for uh, Yvonne, her, the daughter-in-law. Lord, also we give thanks to you for what you've done. Rejoicing this week how we have seen your hand upon my wife's dad as he is recovering i pray for also the other voices of thanks that we've lifted up before you today lord be with them and we look in the world around us oh god and the human tragedy that happens so often even to the innocent and the unaware I pray for those who have lost their lives down south with these terrible storms. Lord, we can't, it is hard to think of how many people have been killed, at least 20. 
Lord, we think about those who are even still missing in this factory explosion. Be with them, O oh God. O oh Father, we know that this world that we live in is groaning for the day of redemption, the day of the great glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus. And as we wait, give us patience, we give us hope as we lift up our eyes and prayers to thee. O Lord, long ago you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands, but you are the same, and your, ear, your years have no end. The children of your servants shall live secure. Their offsprings shall be established in your presence. Thank you for the great and precious promises that are ours through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And remember the words that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn before our sermon is Rejoice, the Lord is King. The Pilgrim Hymnal 204, if you need it, I believe it's verses 1, 2, and 4. 204 in the Pilgrim Hymnal. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Join me in prayer. Dear Lord God, surprise us, shake us, offend us, but ultimately save us through your generosity, grace, and love. In Jesus' name, amen. As I've mentioned in several sermons, I think a theme that comes up in the uh, selection of passages from the Gospel of Matthew that we have in our Lenten time is Lent is a season of opportunity. 
and a lost opportunity can be a terrible thing. The verses read today, the verses that have a prophetic view, uh, an apocalyptic view of the coming of Jesus returning to this world, the Son of Man who comes in power and great glory and divides the goat from the sheep. I have remember that these verses as a young child. I remember, I'm sure I was under 10 years old and I was in Sunday school and I heard these verses read and I know the teacher must have said something but when I walked out of the room, later on thinking about the verses, I thought, okay, when Jesus comes, make sure you're on the right-hand side, not the left, the right-hand <laughs> side. <sighs> Though my thoughts were those of a child, I see the interaction with this text by many commentators and preachers basically having that same idea, the same sentiment. How do we get to the right side? How can we be the sheep and definitely not on the left side and be goats? Some would even come very close to describing what Jesus is saying here and attributing it to almost a works salvation. That because you do certain works, you're accepted into heaven. And because you don't do certain works, you are sent to damnation. Though there are many parts, then that definitely is not true because salvation is only by the grace of God and our standing is in grace. But I think what is really being talked about here is something in the general gospel, the general message of Christ that sometimes we may miss. Though many parts of this parable or prophecy that can, can be debated as far as proper interpretation a lot of the commentaries I read on this talk about issues such as who are the nations and who are the sheep and who are the goats and who are my brethren that Jesus is talking about. But this morning, I want to put this in a context more to the greater narrative from the Gospel of Matthew because Matthew is trying to tell us a story. He's trying to tell us a story about what is the kingdom and this is the concluding teaching that Jesus has on the kingdom of God. This is the last public teaching by Jesus because in the next chapter, in chapter 26, we have the Last Supper, we have the betrayal, and then we have the crucifixion. This teaching prophecy here, parable of prophecy here, bookends very significantly with the first words of the public teachings of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see the, they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so in Matthew chapter 5, we read the Beatitudes, where the kingdom of heaven is for the poor, the meek, the mourners, and those that seek and hunger after righteousness. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is for the zeros of this world, those who are excluded, those who don't fit into the categories of this world, the world of power, the empires of this world. Matthew 25 now tells us how that we are to distinguish the citizens of the kingdom of heaven from the citizens of the kingdom of this world. A significant theme in Matthew and, yes, the entire Bible is the story of empires in conflict. In Jesus' time, it was the empire of heaven conflicting with the empire of Rome. Now, an empire, yes, is a political entity, a power entity, but it is marked by the essential, the essential values and practices that define those who participate in that empire. And so that is what's being discussed in the Bible. How do these principles, these values manifest the ones that are for the kingdom of heaven and the ones that are establishing the kingdoms or the kingdom of this world? The story of redemption is also a story of empires in conflict. 
we see in Revelation 11, 15, there are loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The empire of this world is in conflict with the empire of God or the kingdom of heaven is often referred to. And though we don't like to talk about these kinds of things, if we don't understand the conflict that's going on, we don't understand our role in this world, how we're to oppose evil and how we're to work for justice. You see, the empire of this world is based on a complicated hierarchy of gifts and debts. In other words, who do I owe so that I can be in their good favor and who must I curry favor to get something out of the relationship? We always, in the kingdom of this world, others are viewed as instruments for our own power, instruments for our own possessions, instruments for our own wealth. And that is why this conflict comes here in this passage of Scripture. And this is the, uh, this is the, the, the um, struggle that we have in this world. Because everything is built on who do I owe and who can I curry favor to do something for me. You see... The empire of heaven is marked by the character of the king. Matthew 20, 28 says this, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom of many. The laws of the empire of God are to love God, to love your neighbor, and to live a life of mercy. The empire of this world manifests itself in a system of constituents, especially in the kind of structure we're living under, too. Groups that our politicians must pander to, to stay in power, to get their vote. This is a system of debt and gift. In other words, this politician did this for me, so I have to vote for him or her. Some groups... I think we can identify this kind of constituents with some of the labels that we hear often about these kinds of groups. There are those who use the words freedom-loving American, those who use the word racially oppressed, those that defend unions, and those that defend small businesses. And these are things that we hear that sound Higher, it sounds like, okay, that's something good, but unfortunately they break down to be just constituents in an empire of this world, the empire where it's not, well, who is doing the right thing, but who is doing something for me. This was expressed so clearly when a politician said to a predominantly black audience, I, if you don't know who to vote for, you ain't black. I'm not picking on that individual, but I'm just using it as, an, as a symbol of this really is this idea of constituency. And if you're part of constituency, you owe me your vote. Our political uh, uh, rhetoric is filled with such statements and and. Yes, it is these code words that are constantly being thrown at us that we're supposed to understand and identify. So that is what we struggle with, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of this world. When we come to the words of Jesus here, we want to look at them and say, okay, if I am a sheep, I need to be working with this kind of a person. We need to identify a group. 
And that often falls into this idea of working with a constituency. We want to define, we want a definite target as we read Jesus' words here. We want a narrow target group because it ke helps keep our project manageable. Others argue that compassion should be directed to anyone in need, Christian or not, therefore creating a much larger pool of potential least ones. Why didn't Jesus give his disciples a clearer identification of the least ones? Perhaps if we're able to have a definite least ones that we must minister to, then we have become the goats ourselves. Often I see our approach is between the haves and the have-nots. We are too tempted to think, okay, we have to go among the poor. And so we go into the socioeconomically depressed areas and people that struggled. We, we, we say, okay, I need to limit my help, my, my work, my, my, my charity, my kindness, my good works to this area. The poor are the best example of the, best, of the least of these, but, but our help, our work does not, is not limited to the poor. You see, by limiting ourselves to the poor, we want to limit the responsibility of who we have to serve. Basically, we're saying if I have to serve those that are blank, they fill in the blank, that I don't have to serve those who are the other constituency, are blank. And so I think that's where we have to be careful. If we come to these passage here and say, okay, Jesus, if, you, if I see a person that has a full stomach, I don't need to minister to them. If I have a person that's fully clothed, I don't need to minister to them. If I have a per see a person that has a secure home, I don't have to minister to them. And that's what I think happens too often. We get such a narrow view of those that we should minister to that we become the goats. Because there's a key here that I think ultimately we have to experience. I have noticed so many times that the causes of justice for which the church stands up are often co-opted by the kingdom of this world. The church has stepped in for those who need the church's compassion, the ones who are rejected, the ones who are beat up, the ones who are object uh, of attack by the agents of power. These are so often barred from societal life, and it is up to the church to show compassion to this one. A great example of this cause is the cause of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He spoke with a powerful, prophetic vision of the empire of God to this world. He brought conviction on those who are in a power and authority because they had not turned their hearts of compassion toward the least of these, toward the, uh, or toward the black people, the African Americans in our country. And they knew they were wrong. But Dr. King and his ministry had something that the kingdom of this world coveted. And that was his influence, his power, his sway over a large group of people. And so I feel they co-opted this movement, not because they had compassion for the least of these, but they wanted power. The empire of this world loves division. They love group against group. So instead of Dr. King's vision of a world where all of God's children can walk hand in hand, we have degenerated into now where someone of a different skin color 
or different human sexuality must be our suspect. I have witnessed this in my own life, and I am not a uh, 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 excluded type of person. I describe myself as an educated, white, heteronormative, elderly, cis male with a southern accent. But because of that, I have people as assume that I am racist. And if I don't say the right words, if I don't use the right catchphrases, I have become someone in trouble because my southern accent immediately somebody suspects me of waving the Confederate flag, and that is definitely not the truth. Because what happens in this world as long as the other is our enemy, we, don't, we can't see Jesus when he comes to us. So yes, don't feel sorry for me, but I've realized that. I've also realized being a a white, middle-class male, I can walk into most places and not even have to worry about who's around there. And, and so I realized that issue, the issues of, of being in, in a society where people are put into groups, I have to be careful with. But we also, what I'm trying to denounce is this idea of, of looking at someone on the outside and immediately evaluating them if they are for us or against. I heard an, of an interview with a close associate of Mother Teresa by an NPR reporter. The question that the reporter asked to the nun was, what made Mother Teresa an effective leader? The nun replied, she took seriously or literally the words of Matthew 25 if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. The, M the NPR reporter replied, oh, no, 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 I, what I'm saying is, was she a good organizer? Was she a team builder? Was she an effective manager? No. She took the words of Jesus to the least of these very significant, literally. She wanted to live Jesus' words. The reporter didn't understand. The nun said later that he did not have ears to hear because he was concentrated on looking at Mother Teresa and, it, and the structure of the kingdom of this world, a power of authority, of charisma, rather than of the mission of seeing Jesus in the face of every person that we meet. It's interesting in this, the words here, these texts, the sheep and the goat respond to Jesus the same way. When did we see you, Jesus? When did we see you? And though they respond the same way, you know the responses are very different. Because the righteous, from what Jesus says, show mercy and compassion. They, they show this out of their hearts because they are motivated by the laws of the kingdom of heaven. And so they know that they must love God. They, they have a heart to love our neighbor and to show mercy. I'm in his kingdom and that what brings delight to my soul. The unrighteous do not show mercy and compassion because they're motivated by the laws of the kingdom of this world. And if I don't see someone important, I don't have to worry about them. That is what was going on. The question is not so much as what you do as where is your heart? What is controlling you? These parables of Lent, as I commented in a couple of sermons, discuss a theme. What happens when God shows up? Yes, here we see the Son of Man coming in his glory and all the angels with him. And he is sitting on his glorious throne. But the parable that Jesus 
tells us is not really about Jesus coming then. It's about how we encounter Jesus now. Jesus is among us. Jesus is here. And that is what we have to do. That is why. That is what we do to be a citizen of his kingdom. Know that every person we meet is created in the image of God and therefore can manifest Jesus. So whether I'm talking to a person like I did earlier this week that had a baby in the car and no formula on how can you help me? Can you help us get formula for our child? And then we found out that there's no formula around here for sale. So we had to, I had to help them the best I could. But we look at someone like that and say, okay, that's an encounter for Jesus. But how about a person in a nice car? How about a person with nice clothes? How about a person that smells nice? Do we realize that those interactions are also times that we minister for Jesus by showing compassion and mercy, kindness and love? You see, Jesus is, is the, the coming of Jesus is not just something that is then. It is something that is now. And that's why we are unaware so many times of when we meet Jesus. But that is where he is. Let us pray. God of justice, you have shown yourself in this world to the poor, or in the poor, the hungry and the needy. Make us willing participants of your grace and generosity so that when you come again, we will know your face. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Pilgrim hymn number 93, if you will need it, and let us stand together for our closing hymn. Remember our meal tonight, be in prayer for it, and attend it if you can. May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may he give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your hearts enlightened, you may perceive what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, 
And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? All these things he has put under the feet and has made Christ the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all in all. Be filled with the spirit of Christ. And may God give us eyes to see Christ whom he encounters.